Okay, I think we are up and live on the Cancer Dietitian YouTube channel. So welcome everyone for our April nutrition webinar with me. I'm Julie and I am the Cancer Dietitian. I am author and creator of cancerdietitian.com. I am also the um, creator of the Cancer Dietitian podcast. And then there's several social media channels that go along with the Cancer Dietitian. So hopefully you're connected with me through the website, through the webinars, articles, um, and the podcast. But if you have any questions about that, just let me know. I am going to share my screen so we can get started. And for those of you who are watching live, um, we're going to be doing a couple of different questions today. So only the people who are participating on Zoom will be able to answer the questions, but I will share those results with everybody and kind of describe it. And um, anybody who's on with Zoom can answer your questions in the Q&A. You can put it in the chat and I will try to make sure to get those answered. Okie dokie. So our topic for today is carbs. Are they necessary or not? And I find this to be pretty much a common question that my clients have. And having worked in nutrition for 15 years, um, it's not a new thing. It sort of ebbs and flows depending on what current diet fads there are out there. So right now I would say that we're kind of in the middle of maybe a low carb diet fad with the keto diet and some other um, you know, trends. So we'll be talking about that today. So for those of you who aren't familiar with me, this is just information about me. This is a picture, my headshot from a little over a year ago. So obviously my hair has been growing uh, for the last year. Um, but I am a dietitian. I work for Cancer Services. We are a nonprofit agency. That's how all of these programs are available to you at no charge. So if you are considering a donation to your, your favorite nonprofit, please keep us in mind. Um, all of our uh, funding goes to support educational programs like this. We do education in our local community as well as online. We have education available in English as well as Spanish. And then we do financial assistance for our local cancer survivors in the Winston-Salem area. So um, that's what we do at Cancer Services. And I'm honored to be the wellness director. And it's been 13 years now that I've been on staff. So pretty much the entire time I've been at Cancer Services, they have supported cancerdietitian.com. I brought it with me um, and couldn't do it without the team that we have at Cancer Services. So. I appreciate all of you joining me tonight. And for your help, if you participated in any of the surveys that we did in the past to help determine which topics to cover, this was one of them. So that's how I came up with this. Um, so I do appreciate all the engagement that many of my followers uh, participate in when I ask you to join and give your ideas and surveys. Um, this is, that's what it's for. So we can come up with topics that are interesting to you. So my background, I am a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition, which just means that I have to take an exam every five years to prove that I'm current and knowledgeable about specifically oncology nutrition. I have a master's in public health from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and then my undergraduate degree is in biology. So I've taken a lot of courses on human anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, nutrition, all of those things, which actually play really well into tonight's topic. Um, because carbohydrates is a broad category of nutrients. And so I'm going to hopefully give you a little bit of information about that um, so that you understand how it works in our bodies. So first of all, though, I do want to, let's see, get you started on our, um, what I call sort of our pre- evaluation. So this is, this helps me know where you are in terms of your knowledge about carbohydrates. It will probably help us to um, kind of tailor the presentation today. And so there are five questions for you to answer. Um, one of them, you can choose more than one answer, but the rest of them, you have to just choose one answer. So the questions are, how would you rate your knowledge of carbohydrates? Um, are carbohydrates healthy for cancer survivors? Which of these particular food groups that I have listed in your quiz are sources of carbohydrates or contain carbohydrates? And then true or false questions, do simple carbohydrates have fiber? And 
do all carbohydrates have gluten? So I'm going to have to give a little bit of time for people to answer. It's a lot of questions. You have to think. Um, I would like to think, well, uh, I'll ask these questions again at the end of our webinar. Um, so hopefully there's at least one thing maybe that you'll, you'll learn throughout our session tonight. But um, this just helps me understand where everyone is coming from. So people are entering. I don't have any entertainment for those of you who are watching either on the live stream or watching the recording. Uh, sorry, there's nothing to entertain you with during this particular uh, part of the webinar. I don't even have music. <laughs> All right, so about a little more than half of people have entered. So I'll give a little more time. Response is still coming in. Good work. We actually could probably do sessions on carbohydrates, protein, and fat as three separate topics. But when we did the survey, carbs were the one that people wanted to know most about. So, all right, almost 80% in. Oh, now we're up over 80. That's good. I'll give a little more time. Pretty good response rate, I'll say. We'll see how many people stick around to do it at the end. <laughs> Sometimes people wander away from the computer and don't always come back, I think. That's the thing about webinars. I was talking with my intern today about the difference between when I would do classes in person versus webinars. And I've always done webinars, um, at least for the last, I don't know, uh, six or seven years, um, but also would offer in-person classes. Um, and in-person classes, people had to pay attention, mostly. Uh, but with webinars, you know, when you start to get bored, you're going to tune out or do something else or wander away. So we'll see how many people stick it out to do the post-test. Okay, I am going to close it in five seconds. So if you're finishing up your survey, go ahead and click to send it. All right, here we go. I'm going to end polling and then I will share results and they are um, anonymous. So what we have, we have um, a variety of people in our group. So some people don't feel like they know much at all. Some people know a little bit. Some people know a lot. And one other expert. I'm going to go with that's a dietitian who's on here, but we'll see. Um, are carbohydrates healthy for cancer survivors? 62% said yes. One person said no and some said maybe. So we'll see what you think at the end. Um, which of the following food groups contain carbohydrates? 97% said grains, 56% said dairy, 38% said leafy vegetables, 97 said starchy vegetables, 71% said fruit. And do simple carbohydrates have fiber? True. 35% of people, false 65% of people. And then all carbohydrates have gluten, true 9% of people and false 91% of people. So let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing those results. Somehow I clicked away from the screen, sorry about that. Where is my, there we go. Um, so what we will do is answer all those questions. And you'll find out if you are right or not. I'm gonna, not going to give you all the answers right up front. Um, but this is what we're basically going to cover is those kinds of questions. We're going to talk about are they healthy or not because low carb diets have been a fad. Um, and you are wondering, you know, a lot of people feel like, well, I thought I knew, but now all these other people are talking, you know, I see these things on social media. I'm not sure I know what I think anymore. Um, do we need carbohydrates? Which carbohydrates are the best? How much do we really need? I had a question come in. Um, earlier today from somebody asking how much they would need. And I had another question from somebody um, asking about which types are best for diabetics. So we'll be sure to include those um, answers in our seminar today. So this is what I wanna start with. Actually, it's a five minute video 
um, about how the digestive system works. And I think that it's really important that we remember how the digestive system works when we're talking about how our bodies use different types of foods, because carbohydrates are one type of macronutrient. Oh, let me get the right screen up here. Um, so let me go ahead and play that um, for you. And let me know if there's anything wrong with the sound. If I need to turn it up, just put it in the chat. Across the whole planet, humans eat on average between 1 and 2.7 kilograms of food a day. That's over 365 kilograms a year per person, and more than 28,800 kilograms over the course of a lifetime. And every last scrap makes its way through the digestive system. Comprised of 10 organs, covering 9 meters, and containing over 20 specialized cell types, this is one of the most diverse and complicated systems in the human body. Its parts continuously work in unison to fulfill a singular task, transforming the raw materials of your food into the nutrients and energy that keep you alive. Spanning the entire length of your torso, the digestive system has four main components. First, there's the gastrointestinal tract, a twisting channel that transports your food and has an internal surface area of between 30 and 40 square meters, enough to cover half a badminton court. Second, there's the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, a trio of organs that break down food using an array of special juices. Third, the body's enzymes, hormones, nerves, and blood all work together to break down food, modulate the digestive process, and deliver its final products. Finally, there's the mesentery, a large stretch of tissue that supports and positions all your digestive organs in the abdomen, enabling them to do their jobs. The digestive process begins before food even hits your tongue. Anticipating a tasty morsel, glands in your mouth start to pump out saliva. We produce about 1.5 liters of this liquid each day. Once inside your mouth, chewing combines with the sloshing saliva to turn food into a moist lump called the bolus. Enzymes present in the saliva break down any starch. Then your food finds itself at the rim of a 25 centimeter long tube called the esophagus, down which it must plunge to reach the stomach. Nerves in the surrounding esophageal tissue sense the bolus's presence and trigger peristalsis, a series of defined muscular contractions. That propels the food into the stomach, where it's left at the mercy of the muscular stomach walls, which pound the bolus, breaking it into chunks. Hormones secreted by cells in the lining trigger the release of acids and enzyme-rich juices from the stomach wall that start to dissolve the food and break down its proteins. These hormones also alert the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder to produce digestive juices and transfer bile, a yellowish-green liquid that digests fat, in preparation for the next stage. After three hours inside the stomach, the once shapely bolus is now a frothy liquid called chyme, and it's ready to move into the small intestine. The liver sends bile to the gallbladder, which secretes it into the first portion of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Here, it dissolves the fats floating in the slurry of chyme so they can be easily digested by the pancreatic and intestinal juices that have leached onto the scene. These enzyme-rich juices break the fat molecules down into fatty acids and glycerol for easier absorption into the body. The enzymes also carry out the final deconstruction of proteins into amino acids and carbohydrates into glucose. This happens in the small intestine's lower regions, the jejunum and ileum, which are coated in millions of tiny projections called villi. These create a huge surface area to maximize molecule absorption and transference into the bloodstream. The blood takes them on the final leg of their journey to feed the body's organs and tissues. But it's not over quite yet. Leftover fiber, water, and dead cells sloughed off during digestion make it into the large intestine, also known as the colon. The body drains out most of the remaining fluid through the intestinal wall. What's left is a soft mass called stool. The colon squeezes this byproduct into a pouch called the rectum, where nerves sense it expanding, and tell the body when it's time to expel the waste. 
The byproducts of digestion exit through the anus, and the food's long journey, typically lasting between 30 and 40 hours, is finally complete. TED-Ed is a non- All right, so I think that's just a great reminder. Sorry, I should have warned you if you're eating dinner while you're watching this, <laughs> that we are going to talk a lot about digestion. Um, but I feel like that's a good reminder and a good way to set us up for understanding how our body uses carbohydrates. Um, I had a comment on one of my social media feeds once, someone asking, you know, well, if I have a lot of belly fat, does that affect my digestion? And no, it doesn't because your digestive system is, is sort of its own organ on it. You know, there's multiple organs as part of it, but it really does take the food and takes it down this tube and processes it into little pieces that can be absorbed into your blood. So as we talk about carbohydrates, Carbohydrates are actually what we call a macronutrient. So fats, proteins, and carbohydrates are all macronutrients, which means we eat a lot of them compared to things like vitamins and minerals, which are called micronutrients, and we eat small amounts of micronutrients. So carbohydrates are one type of macronutrient. Uh, they're found in multiple different types of food groups. They contain nutrients that are broken down and absorbed as glucose. And so when you think about that video and kind of all the places that your food has to go to be digested, when it comes to carbohydrates, we'll talk about how our body breaks them down. We consume them in a variety of, of different foods, and then our body breaks those foods down into individual nutrients that we then absorb from our intestines into our blood, or in the case of fiber, as is a component of carbohydrates, it may pass through undigested, it may help feed our intestinal bacteria, um, but that glucose actually provides our body with energy. And so glucose is the building block of carbohydrates. It is also what gives our cells energy. Um, so when I hear people talking about glucose and thinking only of it as sort of a sugar, I often remind them that actually that's what gives our um, muscle cells, our brain cells, all the cells of our body, that's what gives it energy is the glucose. So you fuel your body with carbs for energy, just like you fuel your car with gas for it to go. Now, um, some people have heard about uh, sugars and um, glucose being a cause to grow cancer. And so I have a handout on my website, which is cancerdietitian.com slash sugar. There's a handout about sugar and cancer. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about simple sugars. Um, but a cancer cell does not preferentially use glucose over, you know, any of the other cells of your body. So a cancer cell does use glucose for energy, just like all the other cells of your body. Um, what shows up on a PET scan when you think about that radioactive glucose solution, um, what shows up on a PET scan is actually the metabolic rate of the cancer cells that basically burn up the glucose faster than the other cells of your body. And that's what makes it light up in the PET scan. So if, if you've ever heard about glucose um, glowing in a cancer cell, the reason is not the presence of glucose. It's not like glucose only goes to the cancer cells. The glucose goes to all the cells of your body. It's just that during a, a PET scan, they can see how fast that glucose is metabolized and the faster it's metabolized, the more it glows on the screen. All right, so these are the different food groups that contain carbohydrates. So for that question, it was um, there are multiple ones on here. So fruits do contain carbohydrates, vegetables, certain types of vegetables. So the leafy um, vegetable was a little bit of a trick question. Um, so the leafy vegetables, they contain, car technically they contain carbohydrates because they have fiber in them but they do not contain a lot of digestible types of carbohydrates like you would find in grains or in the starchy vegetables. Um, so I would tend to say that leafy vegetables are not necessarily a source of carbohydrates or at least the type of carbohydrate that would influence your blood sugar levels. Um, although they do have fiber, so that technically is a carbohydrate, um, but for sure starchy vegetables, grains, um, 
certain dairy products, so milk and yogurt, yes, have carbohydrate, although cheese, once they separate the curds from the whey, and curds is what makes cheese and whey has the lactose in it, which is the carbohydrate. And then of course, we're all very familiar with the carbohydrates that are in sweets. Um, and certain processed foods, they will add carbohydrates. A lot of times it's for sugar, um, for flavoring. So some processed foods that you might not think would have a lot of um, carbohydrates in it might have it for baking purposes or for food safety purposes or something like that. So this is where we sort of differentiate between types of carbohydrates. Um, so there's two major types of carbohydrates. One is what we call simple sugars and the other is what we call complex carbohydrates. So simple sugars are um, broken into two different types, monosaccharides, mono means one. So that's one and saccharide basically means sugar. So one sugar unit. Um, so glucose, fructose and galactose are the basic units of um, sugar. And then disaccharides, which di means two, so that's two sugars bonded together. Um, so they are called simple sugars because they are either just one or two, they're not very complicated. Um, when you think about things like table sugar, that's sucrose. Um, same thing, what I would say honey is very similar. It's glucose and fructose. It's just that in the honey version, the bees have broken it, the bond apart for you. Whereas in the table sugar version, your body has to break those bonds apart. But we call them simple sugars because that's basically all they are, is these um, sugar units. So even the disaccharides will be in the digestive process, they're broken apart, and then they're absorbed as a monosaccharide. So when you think about that digestive video, and our bodies are you know, using our stomach acid, they're using, if you notice, they talked about in the saliva or salivary amylase, is an enzyme that actually starts the process of breaking down carbohydrates in your mouth. You swallow it, then you saw your stomach sort of punching around that um, bulk of food to start breaking it down. And then it goes into your intestines and you have all these enzymes and digestive juices that slowly break apart all of these little pieces of carbohydrates until you break them into these monosaccharides. And the monosaccharides is the only way that they can be digested. And so it actually takes quite a bit of work for our bodies to take carbohydrates and break them down into these individual little pieces that can then be um, absorbed into our blood. And our blood carries those pieces all around our bodies and basically says, hey, cells, do you need this? Do you need this? It's running around all over the place. The cells are like, hey, yeah, I need that. And then the doors open and in come um, the, the glucose to give energy to those cells. Now, the other type of carbohydrate uh, grouping is what we call complex carbohydrates. So whereas these monosaccharides and disaccharides are just simple one and two part sugars, the complex carbohydrates are actually complex or much more complicated. They have monosaccharides or disaccharides as part of them, but they have lots of other things included with them. So glycogen, cellulose, starch are all types of complex carbohydrates. So simple carbs, we, I kind of mentioned this already, but this is the most basic form. So when we talk about, well, we don't want people to eat a lot of simple sugars, it doesn't mean that you can never have them. If you followed me long enough, you know that I will tell you that, you know what, we should all be able to have special treats that taste delicious. Um, you do not have to completely cut them out of your life, but we, it's about the pattern of eating. Like how often do you eat these? That's what's most important. So when we think about simple sugars, that means that the, the food that you're eating is providing you with the most basic form of carbohydrate and probably not much else. So you can see on here, basically syrup, um, sweets, of course, table sugars, there's a sugar cereal there that's uh, pretty processed into very simple carbohydrates. And then you have um, kind of the crackers that are not necessarily whole grain crackers. So they're pretty much um, mostly simple carbs and maybe a little bit of complex carbohydrates. But you can see on here this list of simple sugars. And this is a common question that people will ask me, well, is there a difference between, you know, is honey more healthy for you? Is maple syrup more healthy for you? Um, is high fructose corn syrup evil? Should I avoid it? And the honest truth is that simple sugars are all very similar to each other. They are either disaccharides or monosaccharides in themselves. So honey technically is fructose and glucose separated and sucrose is 
is fructose and glucose stuck together. So chemically, they are basically the same thing. Um, maple syrup, same thing. Um, you know, the one that's in the picture here is actually probably corn syrup and not really that much maple syrup, but even the syrup that comes right out of the tree is a simple sugar. Um, so there's not a significant difference. Now, high fructose corn syrup will have more fructose as that, as that monosaccharide than you would find in, in sucrose or table sugar, or if you made your own simple syrup, um, agave syrup, you know, there might be little differences in the amount of which type of monosaccharide, but to be quite honest, they're basically all the same. Um, there, and so what I would tell you is it doesn't really matter which one you use. They have different purposes for what flavors you like or what baking purposes you have, um, but they are not significantly different. So simple sugars are, are simple sugars. All right, so I mentioned fructose and glucose is what makes table sugar. When we consume that, our digestive system breaks up the, those bonds and we absorb the fructose and glucose separately. Um, so once that glucose and fructose is absorbed into the blood, it's carried around for use by all of our cells. And then fructose is very similar. It's absorbed as fructose, and then it goes into the liver, and the liver converts it into basically a glucose-like substance that is just essentially used by the body as glucose. Um, so in the case of something like high fructose corn syrup, it's going to require your body to take more you know, parts of fructose and convert it into this glucose-like substance, and then your cells can use it that way. Um, and then lactose. So lactose, many of you who maybe are lactose intolerant are very familiar with this one, but it is also a disaccharide. We call it a milk sugar because it's found in yogurt um, and milk. Now, things like Greek yogurt tend to have less of the milk sugar because um, it's more concentrated in protein. If you have something like lactate milk, it is basically the lactose already broken apart for you. Or if you take um, lactate pills, those are essentially just enzymes that those of us who tolerate milk just fine already have in our intestines that breaks down the bond. So the reason people are lactose intolerant is because um, they do not have the enzyme to break apart the glucose and the galactose. And your, your body cannot digest or absorb that lactose by itself, it has to be broken apart into the individual pieces in order for your body to be able to absorb it into the blood and use it. So if it's stuck together and you don't have the enzyme, the lactate enzyme in order to break it apart, then what happens is you have this bonded together two sugars in your intestines and your body can't digest and absorb it. And so the bacteria in your intestines are like, ooh, we're gonna eat on this and we're gonna produce gas and that makes you feel bloated and it might give you gas. Um, so what happens is if you buy lactate milk, it's already, the bonds are broken for you. So if you've noticed it has a sweeter taste to your tongue, that's because your, your tongue can taste the two separate monosaccharides rather than the one that's bonded together. So that's the scoop on lactose. And then galactose is converted quickly into glucose after it's absorbed and basically treated as glucose. So when we talk about, you know, your blood glucose levels, that it could be coming from a variety of places. It's not just simple sugars that are causing the glucose in your, in your um, blood to go up. So here's our disaccharides here at the bottom. Maltose is glucose and glucose together. Sucrose is glucose and fructose together. And lactose is glucose and galactose. Um, mal maltose, I don't see too often. Sometimes you can see it in an ingredient list and it's, you know, it's just two glucoses. So then what are complex carbohydrates? Complex carbohydrates, as I mentioned before, are more bonded together. So more carbohydrates bonded together. Um, they are also broken down into the basic sugars before they're absorbed. But what happens is that those sugars are bonded together, not just with each other, but they're also bonded together with other things that come with these complex carbohydrates. And those other things are things like vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. And it's, it has indigestible fibers and they're all bonded together in the mix with these simple sugars. 
Um, and so what I say is that complex carbohydrates, we consider these more of the quote healthy carbohydrates because not only are they providing you with the basic building blocks of glucose that you know fuels every cell of your body, but they're also packaged with a lot of other nutrients that are really good for us that our bodies need. Um, we have to break, break down a lot more bonds in order to get them into individual nutrients. So that process requires more work. And there's so many other nutrients that come along with these complex carbohydrates. Um, includes fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, other things. So if you think about it, really it's kind of a combination of simple sugars plus all these other healthy nutrients that go into making complex carbohydrates that you find in you know, whole wheat bread or sweet potatoes or an apple or all those other types of carbohydrate sources that we tend to consider more healthy. Um, so someone's asking, since the liver is involved in breaking down high fructose corn syrup, should that contribute to having fatty liver? Um, not necessarily. It's just part of our body's natural system to convert fructose. So uh, fructose is also the sugar that's found in fruit. So that's the typical fruit sugar. Um, so when you eat apples or you eat other fruits, they're going to be higher in fructose than they are in um just the basic glucose. So there's no reason why that would cause a problem. Um, with having fatty liver, I think what we find is that if someone consumes a lot of simple carbohydrates in general, it's not the converting of fructose that's causing the problem. It's actually just sort of the over, over consumption of simple sugars and, and those don't necessarily have all the other nutritious ingredients that is needed. Good question. All right, so here's some examples of complex carbohydrates. Um, you probably could have guessed. <laughs> so these are things like whole grains, their oats, um, whole wheat, quinoa, rice, all different types of you know whole grain rices, corn, popcorn is a whole grain, fruits, vegetables, beans. So these are all types of complex carbohydrates that are packaged with lots of great nutrients that are good for you and lots of fiber. So why are whole grains so important? Um, I think this is also a really key thing for you to understand when it comes to carbohydrates, which is the difference between a whole grain and what we call a refined grain or a processed grain. So the whole grain contains all parts of the grain as it's grown. So all the nutrients, all the parts of it will be included in the same ratio as it's grown. So when we talk about whole, 100% whole wheat bread, it's going to have all the components of wheat um, in the same proportions as the wheat is grown in the ground. So that includes all three of these parts that you see in the picture, the bran, which we're all familiar with. It has a lot of fiber. It has B vitamins and minerals. That's the outside of the grain. You can see there the dark brown. The germ, which is kind of a little seed. It's very packed in nutrients. It's actually kind of what feeds the plant. So it has, um, you can buy things like wheat germ. So technically wheat germ is not whole grain because it's only part of the grain. Technically bran, like all bran cereal is not whole grain because it's only the bran component of it. Um, so the germ has B vitamins, vitamin E, phytochemicals, healthy fats, selenium. And then the endosperm is that starchy middle part that has some proteins, some vitamins, but it's really that part that kind of makes your carbohydrates fluffy. And it has most of what we would have, you know, those basic building blocks for, um, for your starches. And so the difference between a whole grain and a refined grain is that the refined grain only has that starchy inside. So when they do the refining or um, the process of uh, removing the bran and the germ, that's what makes white bread, okay? So white bread is basically, we're gonna take wheat bread or we're gonna take wheat, we're gonna get rid of the bran, we're gonna get rid of the germ, we're gonna have this nice fluffy flour and that's what we're gonna use. So all purpose flour. Um, and then when it's called enriched, that's because, oh, in the middle of the 1900s, we discovered when we take out the bran and the germ that removes a lot of the nutrients. So we better enrich it with certain nutrients. So then we add back some of the nutrients which is a nice thing because there are times that we might like to enjoy some processed um, white grains. And so since they have extra nutrients added to them, that's a little bit, you know, helpful. <laughs> so 
Okay, so let's see. Um, what else do you need to know from this? Most white flowers have been processed to remove those. Um, and then there's all kinds of different examples of types of grains. So also it's important to understand the difference between just whole wheat versus whole grain. So whole wheat is one type of grain. There's lots and lots of different types of grains. Wheat is just one. So if something says it's 100% whole wheat bread, it's made all from wheat and it's made from the, you know, the whole part of the wheat in the same proportion. If it says 100% whole grain bread, that means that it might use some oats, it might use some wheat, it might use some kind of rice or um, millet or rye. And it's a combination of different grains, but if it's 100% whole grain, it means that they're still using all parts of the grain. It's just a combination of different types of grains. So when we encourage whole grain, that's why, because the bran and the germ are also really good for you and we want you to eat it. Fiber is also part of the complex carbohydrates. It's that part that I mentioned before, you cannot digest. Um, so it, that's why it bulks up your stool and it actually helps to feed your good bacteria in your intestines. So if anybody was on my webinar, I think it was from February. Yep, it was February. We talked about immunity. We talked about probiotics and prebiotics and how fiber is a type of prebiotic. It is not something that we absorb into our blood. So any fiber that you eat is not going to be absorbed into your blood. It actually goes in your mouth through your intestines and passes right out. But it has a really important role in helping to reduce risk of colon cancer. It keeps those colon cells really healthy. It keeps your gut bacteria around um, and it's feeding that bacteria. Yes, that bacteria also does produce um, air. So you might notice if you eat a high fiber food that you maybe are a little bit bloated or you have more gas. Um, when we talk about things like beans, whole grains, if you're not used to eating those and all of a sudden you make a big change and you start eating a lot of fiber, it's an adjustment for your body. So that's why we often say if you need to increase your fiber intake, increase it slowly so that your body can kind of get used to it so that your um, you know, your, your intestines can adjust, that bacterial balance can kind of adjust over time if you slowly increase fiber, whereas if you throw a whole lot of fiber and your bacteria is just not ready for it, um, then it can cause a lot of GI distress. All right, let's see. So two different types of fiber. For those of you who have done any kind of cardiac rehab type classes or heart health classes, you've probably heard about soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. So soluble fiber can help lower your glucose levels. Basically, it just kind of slows down the, the digestive process, which means that your glucose rises at a, at a slower rate. Um, so your body will still use the glucose that's in these foods. It's just that it's digested slower and therefore it gets into your blood. It's sort of a slower, steadier pace rather than um, absorbing it all at one time. So these um, foods include soluble fiber, oatmeal. That's why they get that heart health claim. Nuts, beans, lentils, apples, blueberries, essentially all the healthy foods. Um, but insoluble fiber is also really important. So soluble means that it sort of gels up when it's in water. Um, so if you think about Metamucil and you've ever put Met Metamucil in water, that gels up, right? And um, so you need to drink it pretty quickly <laughs> or else it's not gonna be fun to drink. Um, insoluble fiber is the type of fiber that if you put it in water, it would just sink to the bottom. Um, so that helps food move through your digestive process digestive system. So if you think about, um, if you have issues with constipation, we might encourage you to eat more insoluble fiber. Um, wheat, whole grain, couscous, brown rice, legumes, carrots, cucumbers, tomatoes. Honestly, most foods are a combination of soluble and insoluble fiber when we're talking about kind of these healthy carbohydrates. So what is gluten? When we talk about carbohydrates, we have to also talk about gluten. Um, and it always cracks me up because a lot of people who um, maybe are kind of, they're not following a gluten-free diet because they have to, they're following a gluten-free diet because it's the fad. Um, and then you ask them, well, what is gluten? And they have no idea. <laughs> so um, gluten is actually a protein. So you might think that gluten is a carbohydrate, but it is not. It's just that it's a protein that's found in wheat. So only wheat products contain gluten. 
it happens to be very functional in baking. It binds together food. And so um, when it comes to things like, you know, pizza dough or bread or where you like a nice, you know, fluffy kind of um, product, gluten is very, very useful. Um, so for if any of you are celiac or gluten intolerant and you have to avoid gluten, you know how hard it is to try to make, you know, the, the most delicious bread or pizza dough that holds together um, without gluten. It's very difficult. So gluten is essentially only found in wheat. And there's nothing wrong with it for the vast majority of people. Like over 95% of people tolerate gluten just fine. It's a protein, we break it down in our bodies, no problem. But for people who have celiac disease or some other type of wheat intolerance, gluten is what causes them problems. It causes them gas that actually um, can trigger their immune system to respond to it. So it, it treats gluten as an allergy. Um, but for most of us, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. There's no reason to avoid it. Um, so wheat is perfectly healthy for, for most of us and quite toxic for a very small number of people. All right, so it has become a diet trend. Um, despite, you know, those of us who understand the body's systems and nutrition, despite our best efforts to let people know there's nothing wrong with gluten unless you have a problem with gluten, um, a lot of people think somehow it's bad for everyone, but it's not. Um, so the only time gluten's a problem is if somebody has celiac disease, which is, it is kind of difficult to diagnose. Um, but most people, I will say, do not have it. It's an autoimmune disorder. Um, and that, and most people who, who do have problems with gluten have some symptoms that they can pick up. The other thing is if you do have celiac disease and you don't avoid gluten, that can actually increase your risk for certain types of cancer. And that's because of this immune response to gluten. So people with celiac disease absolutely need to avoid gluten. The good news is, turns out that there are, oh, I didn't mean to do that slide yet. Um, lots of different foods that do not contain gluten. So certain ones do contain gluten, wheat, barley, um, rye, and then sort of these combination foods. Now oats don't actually contain gluten. It's just that a lot of times oats are processed in factories where wheat is processed and they're contaminated essentially. So at least in the US, it's not always as um, separate. Um, in other countries and in Europe, I think they do a better job in the factories of keeping them separate. Um, so oats don't have gluten, but they are often contaminated because of the factories. So there was a book called Wheat Belly, and I, I had this in my slide set when I did a presentation like this before. And I'm curious if people have heard of this, um, but there was a, um, a doctor who wrote this book and made a lot of money and got a lot of people all worried about it. But in his book, which was not based on any kind of science, um, he claims that gluten causes uh, fat in the belly, um, which there's no science behind it. It just happened to be a best-selling book and then people kind of got on the bandwagon and decided gluten was the problem. I think we've had enough people going on gluten-free diets and still finding that, guess what? You can eat a lot of gluten-free junk food and it's still not good for you. <laughs> so if you feel like you need to avoid gluten for some reason or another, you actually have quite a few choices for whole grains. Um, however, if you think that you might have celiac disease and you think that you may need to be tested, you should not go on a gluten-free diet before you get tested because then you won't have the gluten in your system that you're reacting to and then the tests will be irrelevant. Um, so that's a, that's a cautionary note. Okay, so we talked about which foods contain gluten. These are a whole lot of different gluten-free grains. Um, some of the ones that I would say are more common to um, the typical American is rice. So a lot of people eat rice. Um, now there are other things. Oh, it's not on this list. It's my favorite grain for breakfast, which is called teff, T-E-F-F. -F. Um, but there's lots of different flours that you can get that are gluten-free. Quinoa, um, Quinoa and rice to me are some of the ones that I eat pretty regularly. I buy them at Costco. Um, so, but there's a lot of different ways that you can consume healthy carbohydrates that do not have gluten in them. Gluten-free is also a label that you can find. Um, and so that, uh, you know, if you do have to avoid gluten, it's relatively, it's better now. You know, back in the 90s, celiacs really had a hard time finding anything that they could 
any prepared foods that they could eat. Now that gluten-free is kind of in this fad, it actually has offered them a lot more options. Um, so somebody mentioned, I was told gluten and dairy products cause inflammation in our body and chronic inflammation leads to cancer. Is this true? No. Um, so there's no evidence that gluten causes inflammation unless you in fact have celiac disease, which I mentioned is really a very small proportion of people. Um, no reason to believe that dairy causes inflammation. Um, certainly some people don't tolerate dairy. So if you're, if it doesn't sit well with you, you, you don't have to consume it. Um, but there's no reason that everyone should go on a gluten-free or a dairy-free diet. And if you're going somewhere where they're telling everyone to be on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet, I would tell you that's not personalized nutrition advice. So um, the idea that chronic inflammation leads to cancer, um, I would say that that is a theory. Um, I think certainly we have evidence that something like um, Barrett's esophagus, where you have a lot of inflammation in your esophagus because of um, stomach acid, coming back up that, you know, we know that that is linked to esophageal cancer. And so then there's a, a thought, a theory that the inflammation is what can result in cancer. But even with all of the research that we've done, it's not an absolute clear answer that, oh, can cancer exists because of inflammation. Um, I think that it's multifactorial and there's lots of things to it. So, um, so to answer your question, there's nothing wrong with gluten. There's nothing wrong with dairy. No, they don't necessarily cause inflammation. And the idea that chronic inflammation causes cancer is just a theory. It's not been proven. Um, so that's not something that is particularly concerning to me when I think about foods. All right, so what happens when people completely eliminate carbohydrates? And to be honest, some people follow low carb diets or they claim they're following low carb diets and they don't really. <laughs> um, they, they might think that they are. Um, but if you were to actually, actually um, eliminate carbohydrates or cut it way, 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 way back, you would be removing dairy foods, right? You would be removing grains, you would be removing fruits, and you would be removing at least half of the vegetables that we have available to us. Um, and so the idea that you would eliminate multiple food groups to me is not necessary. It's not healthy um, and would actually eliminate a lot of essential nutrients. It could take away a lot of fiber. It could take away, um, you know, that glucose. So you'd have to find another way for your body to be supplied with glucose. Um, so they're not proven to promote long-term weight loss any more than other eating patterns. Um, low carb diets should also be discussed with your clinician. So someone did ask about um, diabetes. And so, you know, what I find, and I used to do diabetes management as um, before I worked in oncology. And as part of oncology, we also had to do a lot of diabetes management because it turns out people with diabetes get cancer too. Um, the truth is that even with diabetes, your body needs regular sources of glucose. Um, and so, especially if you're on diabetes medications, you do not want to go on a low carb diet. What you want, which is what most of us quite honestly need, is a regular source of healthy carbohydrates throughout the day. You don't want a whole lot at one time and you don't want to go with none. Um, so the idea of following a low or very low carbohydrate diet to me is not necessary. Now, if your doctor is suggesting it or you're working with a specialized dietitian who think and you want to manage your diabetes as best possible without um, using medication or something like that, there may be cases where people choose to basically be on a very low carbohydrate diet. Um, there are some cases where certain types of um, seizures have seen benefit with, with low carbohydrate or, or what we call the ketogenic diet. Um, but it's a very few number of people who would actually benefit from that. So um, this person's asking, is it better to eat meat instead of legumes or other sorts of plant-based protein when you have diabetes? Um, so the challenge for people with diabetes is basically this whole, well, um, you know, we don't want to load carbohydrates at any one point. So let's say somebody doesn't have diabetes. Say our, you know, our insulin, everything's functioning just fine. We can actually eat a load of carbohydrates, like a lot of cake or you know ice cream. We're at the family picnic. We're really overdoing it, right? And our bodies are made to handle that. Um, if we do not have diabetes, we can 
give that big glucose load or carbohydrate load and our body can kind of handle it. It can, it can manage the glucose, get it back under control within a couple of hours and everything's fine. What happens if you do have diabetes, especially a diabetes that's not very well controlled, if you put a carbohydrate load like that, it's very difficult for your body to handle. Your glucose numbers can skyrocket and they might not come down for several days. And so the one, you know, for, for people with diabetes, I think it's even that much more important that first of all, you choose the healthy carbohydrates that are gonna come with all those other nutrients and are digested slower so that you don't have a quick rise in blood sugars. Um, and the other thing is you do have to balance the carbohydrates a little bit. So in some cases you might choose meat as your protein because it won't provide you carbohydrates and in, on your plate, you might have other types of carbohydrates. Um, but sometimes you might choose legumes and it might be that you're having beans and non-starchy vegetables um, and cheese or something like that in your meal. So it really just depends. We um, used to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with clients who had diabetes, just making sure they understand which foods have carbohydrates and how much they should have at any one time. Um, so if you do have diabetes, um, pretty much all insurance companies are required to offer you diabetes self-management classes, and you can work one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian or a certified diabetes educator who can really help you figure out those questions. So, um, yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, having meat as your protein rather than legumes can make things easier, but that that's not a hard and fast rule. I think that legumes are great for you and have a lot of good fiber. And so while they are sources of carbohydrates, they do have a lot of that undigestible starch. All right, so the bottom line, no, carbs are not bad for you. They're not bad for cancer survivors. The brain runs on glucose. Your muscles need glucose. What is important is the type and amount of carbohydrates that you consume. Are carbohydrates necessary? Technically, no, because your body can survive without eating carbohydrates, but really it's, it's more of a backup plan. <laughs> So it causes high amounts of stress on your body if you don't eat carbohydrates, because that means that your body has to find other sources of glucose because the glucose gives your brain, your muscles and every other cell of your body energy. So if you're not eating it, then your body has to find it. And that process of basically making glucose out of your body's fat stores or protein stores or carbohydrate stores within your muscle is, is hard on the body. It's not the ideal way to get glucose for your blood. And so that's why I say technically it's not necessary because you can get glucose in other places, but it's not ideal to do it that way. Um, so yes, if people go on very low carbohydrate diets, they probably do lose weight pretty quickly, but usually that's because it's water loss because of how you have to make glucose in your body. It releases water. And so then people lose this water weight um, and they think, wow, I'm really doing a great job, but you will, you know, they're going to have to kind of make that up. And then most of us would not want to eat that way for the rest of our lives. And as you've heard me before, you know, I don't think that diets are the way to go. Doing any kind of restrictive eating that you don't think is something that you can do for the rest of your life is not a great way to, to treat your body. All right, so how much carbohydrate do you need? Let's say, all right, Julie, I'm on board with you. Yes, I need carbohydrates, but I wanna make sure I'm eating the healthy types most of the time and that I'm getting the right amount. But, so it might surprise you the amount of carbohydrates that is actually considered healthy. Um, so carbohydrates should make up most of your calories. Now, for those of you math people, you would be right on with me. But if you're not a math person, this might be a little bit confusing because carbohydrates are not the same as calories. So grams of carbohydrate, one gram of carbohydrate is actually four calories. So when we talk about an 1800 calorie diet and the recommendation is that 45 to 65% of your calories would be carbohydrates, we have to do a lot of calculating. So just leave it to me, believe me, if it's an 1800 calorie diet, we're talking about 200 to almost 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. That's 45 to 60% of your calories from carbs. And I know for some people who have counted carbs, that sounds like a lot, but I'm just here to tell you that's what your body needs. And actually the minimum amount that you need for your brain to function 
is 130 grams a day of carbohydrates. So I certainly would not go below that. When we would do diabetes management classes, we often kind of just broke it down to, hey, 30 to 45 grams of carbohydrates at a typical meal and at snacks, and yes, you should have snacks, 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrates is just a general guide. If you're very active, you're an athlete, you're taller, you're larger, you're you know younger, then your carbohydrate needs are gonna be higher because your calorie needs are higher. But if you are older, less active, um, you just have less calorie needs, then your amounts of carbohydrates that you need would be less. But the ratio for most people is about the same. Yes, vegetarians, they tend to have a higher percentage of carbohydrates because of that legume, you know, their protein is also often starchy vegetables. Um, and then somebody who is an elite athlete, they just, they need more of everything, but they certainly would need a lot of carbohydrates. So generally when we talk about a serving, that's about 15 grams of carbohydrate. That's about a slice of bread, half a cup of grains that are cooked. Um, and so the point here is that you have lots of choices in order to, you know, get your carbohydrates for the day. And we've talked about, you know, you could have it in simple sugar. So in our picture here, we've got like a refined white bagel versus all of these non-starchy vegetables, right? So you could get a lot of non-starchy vegetables for 20 grams of carbs versus basically a piece of bread. Um, but you could also compare a white refined piece of bread versus a whole grain piece of bread. And that that's a significant difference in terms of the nutrient density of the foods that you're eating, even when it's the same amount of carbohydrate. So there's no need to eliminate ent entire food groups. Complex carbohydrates are essential for health. They give you lots of nutrients. And then simple carbohydrates, yes, you can still have some of those. It's just, we, we talk about those more in terms of moderation or special occasions. So eat carbs, enjoy your carbs. That's what I say. So I wanted to just run through this summary video and I'm gonna go a little bit over our one hour, um, but this video kind of summarizes what it is that we've talked about when it comes to carbohydrates. So let me see if I can make my computer cooperate. All right, let's see. Here we go. Which of these has the least carbohydrates? This roll of bread, this bowl of rice, or this can of soda? It's a trick question. Although they may differ in fats, vitamins, and other nutritional content, when it comes to carbs, they're pretty much the same. So what exactly does that mean for your diet? First of all, carbohydrate is the nutritional category for sugars and molecules that your body breaks down to make sugars. Carbohydrates can be simple, or complex, depending on their structure. This is a simple sugar, or monosaccharide. Glucose, fructose, and galactose are all simple sugars. Link two of them together, and you've got a disaccharide, lactose, maltose, or sucrose. Complex carbohydrates, on the other hand, have three or more simple sugars strung together. Complex carbohydrates with three to 10 linked sugars are oligosaccharides. Those with more than 10 are polysaccharides. During digestion, your body breaks down those complex carbohydrates into their monosaccharide building blocks, which your cells can use for energy. So when you eat any carbohydrate-rich food, the sugar level in your blood, normally about a teaspoon, goes up, but your digestive tract doesn't respond to all carbohydrates the same. Consider starch and fiber, both polysaccharides, both derived from plants, both composed of hundreds to thousands of monosaccharides joined together, but they're joined together differently, and that changes the effect they have on your body. In starches, which plants mostly store for energy in roots and seeds, glucose molecules are joined together by alpha linkages, most of which can be easily cleaved by enzymes in your digestive tract. But in fiber, the bonds between monosaccharide molecules are beta bonds, which your body can't break down. Fiber can also trap some starches, preventing them from being cleaved, resulting in something called resistant starch. So foods high in starch, like crackers and white bread, are digested easily, quickly releasing a whole bunch of glucose into your blood, 
exactly what would happen if you drank something high in glucose, like soda. These foods have a high glycemic index, the amount that a particular food raises the sugar level in your blood. Soda and white bread have a similar glycemic index because they have a similar effect on your blood sugar. But when you eat foods high in fiber, like vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, those indigestible beta bonds slow the release of glucose into the blood. Those foods have a lower glycemic index, and foods like eggs, cheese, and meats have the lowest glycemic index. When sugar moves from the digestive tract to the bloodstream, your body kicks into action to transfer it into your tissues, where it can be processed and used for energy. Insulin, a hormone synthesized in the pancreas, is one of the body's main tools for sugar management. When you eat and your blood sugar rises, insulin is secreted into the blood. It prompts your muscle and fat cells to let glucose in and jumpstarts the conversion of sugar to energy. The degree to which a unit of insulin lowers the blood sugar helps us understand something called insulin sensitivity. The more a given unit of insulin lowers blood sugar, the more sensitive you are to insulin. If insulin sensitivity goes down, that's known as insulin resistance. The pancreas still sends out insulin, but cells, especially muscle cells, are less and less responsive to it. So blood sugar fails to decrease, and blood insulin continues to rise. Chronically consuming a lot of carbohydrates may lead to insulin resistance, and many scientists believe that insulin resistance leads to a serious condition called metabolic syndrome. That involves a constellation of symptoms, including high blood sugar, increased waist circumference, and high blood pressure. It increases the risk of developing conditions like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, and its prevalence is rapidly increasing all over the world. As much as 32% of the population in the U.S. has metabolic syndrome. So let's get back to your diet. Whether your food tastes sweet or not, sugar is sugar, and too many carbs can be a problem. So maybe you'll want to take a pass on that pasta sushi roll pita burrito donut burger sandwich. All right, so that is the summary for that. I can't find my, there we go, my slides, um, which I thought was just a really good wrap around from what everything we've talked about. Um, so this is a little handout that I'm gonna send you by email. So somebody asked if, um, if we'll send out the slides. So yes, everybody who's on the Zoom webinar tonight, I'll run a report tomorrow. Um, with all your emails and I'll send a follow-up. It'll have a link to a survey, um, which you could also just complete tonight. It's what pops up when the Zoom session ends. Um, and then I will send you a PDF of all the slides and also a PDF of this handout so you can print the one pager and just remember that yes, carbs are good for you and that there's lots of reasons that you eat it. They fuel your body with glucose. They give energy to all your cells. They are in several different healthy food groups. They help provide important nutrients to you. There's lots of different types of healthy carbs. And then whole grains are great for you. Fiber is necessary for health. Yes, you can still have some added sugars in moderation. Um, gluten intolerance only affects a few people. And as a reminder, carbs are not bad for you. And I'll also mention, you know, in the video, it talks about uh, gluten or it talks about uh, uh, glucose and the rate of rise. And then, um, you know, so I think that also remembering that while you might drink a soda by itself, you're not going to eat a piece of white bread by itself. And so the glycemic index is really a measure of how quickly your blood sugar rises as a result of eating that one food all by itself. But you're not going to eat white bread by itself. You're going to eat it in a sandwich and it's going to have meat and it's going to have fat. <laughs> and so you're going to digest it slower. Um, so the glycemic index isn't always something that I use for people when it comes to that. So one other question that came in, how does stevia get metabolized to be used as energy? It doesn't. Um, it doesn't raise blood sugar. So it is not considered a type of carbohydrate. It's considered what I would call, I mean, they, they officially consider it a natural sweetener. 
I mean, I really feel like it's only natural if you use the um, leaf form. If you're using the form that's a white powder or a clear liquid, it's pretty processed. I would just consider it an artificial sweetener. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it, but it, it functions just like um, the other artificial sweeteners would. It provides a sweet taste in your mouth and then it go, passes through your body undigested um, and then is left with your stool. All right, so let me do the post test, which is the same questions as before. So here's our post test. We'll see what you all learned in terms of your knowledge about carbohydrates. Um, do you feel more knowledgeable? Are you about the same? Maybe you feel like you're an expert now. Um, are you confident about whether carbs are healthy for cancer survivors? Are you, do you feel confident about which food groups contain carbohydrates? Or we'll see that, we'll say the type of carbohydrates that tends to um, increase your blood sugars. And then do simple carbohydrates have fiber or not? Yes or no, true or false. And do all carbohydrates have gluten, true or false? So I'm gonna give a little bit more time on that. Um, for people who are watching the live stream or who are watching the recording, I believe this is about the end of what we're gonna talk about. So. If you want to tune out, you can. If you are watching the recording and you would like the handouts, just send me an email, julie at cancerdietitian.com. And I'm happy to email those out to you. Uh, I'll probably, I'll also post them on the website. So maybe you've already found it by now if you're watching the recording. All right, so uh, getting close to half of people who have completed their survey. I'm very pleased to see a lot of people, I, I feel like the numbers are higher for how they feel about their knowledge of carbohydrates. So that's very good. We'll see, I'm gonna give a little bit more time because responses are coming in. For people who have finished their um, poll questions, oh, someone's saying it would only let you answer one for number three. Well, that's gonna mess up my data, isn't it? All right, I'll throw that question out. You pick your favorite one. <laughs> I probably made it uh, an option for the for the pretest and forgot to fix it or make it that way for the post test. So sorry about that. Question three is messed up. Um, what I want to do is put. Oops, goodness. I want to put in the chat this evaluation. So for those of you who are done with your quiz, oh, all right. If you can't submit it, that's okay, the poll. Um, let me see, to everybody. Here's the link for the evaluation for the session. So you can tell me what you learned. All right, we got 70% of people who voted. I'll give you a little bit more time. Sorry for those of you who weren't able to submit it. Don't know what's going on there. All right, five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna end the polling. I'm gonna share the results and I will give you the answers this time. <laughs> How about that? Okay, so a lot, I'm very pleased that many of you scooted up to knowing a lot about carbohydrates, yay. Now you can do this little thing with the bonds. Um, are carbohydrates healthy for cancer survivors? Yes, I would say yes. I can see maybe you could argue a maybe, um, but your body does need carbohydrates. So perfectly healthy for cancer survivors. Which of the following food groups contain carbohydrates? So I know it wouldn't let you choose all the ones that it was supposed to. I would have answered yes to grains, yes to dairy, at least yogurt and milk, not cheese, that's the caveat. Uh, nobody put leafy vegetables. That, that one I wouldn't probably put. Starchy vegetables, yes. Fruit, yes. Very good. All right, simple carbohydrates have fiber. They actually do not. So I'll have to make sure that I make that clear the next time. And all carbohydrates have gluten. False. 
they only some only wheat basically and barley have gluten. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing results. Now everyone has the answers. Um, in the chat, I put a link to a survey, a follow-up evaluation for this particular class. If you don't get to it tonight, I'll send it also in the follow-up. Um, any other questions for you all? Let's see, I don't think I have anything else on here. This is just my contact information. If you have other questions you think of later, feel free to you know, follow me on Facebook, put the question in the Facebook group or um, send me an email. You can find out more information at cancerdietitian.com. I have a cooking class coming up next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Speaking of carbs, we're gonna do delicious desserts. So they're gonna be nutritious and delicious. Um, and then that is it. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to say thank you all for joining me. Thanks for playing the part in the poll questions and our um, evaluations. And if you have questions, let me know. I look forward to it. So I will see you again next time. And thank you all for joining me. Take care.